Hello, Professor B back with us. We're going to take a look in this episode at how we set up and execute a user experience or usability testing study. I think it will be helpful to our semester projects and as you go forward in your professional careers, if you ever have a need to see how well what you are doing is working, you can take these practices and principles along with you and do them in your own workplace. And perhaps the place you get hired at will already have some of these things in place. So let's dive in and take a look at our presentation. All right, so in this episode, we're talking about planning our user experience usability testing studies. And to do that, we need to get a bunch of pieces together, decide what we're gonna do, um, look at our overall options. So we will take a look at what types of studies there are for us to do, what we want to get done for our users. We'll look at some methods and scenarios and then some evaluation and some nitty-gritty details at the end. First of all, we need to know that there's two types of usability studies or two categories, two classes. The first one of which we call a formative study. In this type of usability testing and studying, we evaluate our process with a test as we're going through the steps. So as we're designing our product, we might stop, do a usability test, see if we find any problems, any pain points for our users, uh, identify issues, then we take it back to the design table, we make some recommendations or we fix it, and then continue the development process and stop at another stage down the road and again evaluate it. And we continue this cycle over and over until we reach the final product and push it out to our users. Okay. These are some questions we might be interested in answering when we're doing formative studies. Okay. Most of them relate to how well is it working for you now? Are there some big overarching problems we're running into? And how do we fix those to make sure that our users um, can deal with our products fine? The other class is what we call a summative study. It's evaluated after we're completely done with the project and then we take the results of our usability test and see if we met our objectives once we're finished. There's no room to improve it at this point. And then how does it compare to other products that do similar things? In this case, these are some of the questions we might ask. Did we meet the goals for our project? Have we met improvements from one major product release to the next? Remember, it's not a formative, so the only time we test it is after we think it's done and we've pushed it out to the public. Okay? And then we might ask some questions about the overall usability. How do our numbers stack up? Okay. Always, in our writing, in our classroom, in our professional life, we're mindful of our users, taking care for our audience. Our goals are to blend well the topics of performance and satisfaction. We want our products to perform well and then make users happy, which gives us good satisfaction ratings. Yeah. Right. There are several things in the usability study that we can test. Okay. We can see how well our users complete a transaction. And we know the transactions have a well-defined start and end. We can determine whether or not they're successful and if they're not successful, we can see how severe those issues were. Are they enough to take it back to the drawing board? Or can we make minor tweaks and move on? And would our users want to repeat these processes over and over again? Okay. We can also compare two products in an A-B type test. The example shown here is two electric toothbrushes from two different companies. And we might evaluate how well they brush the teeth, how well they charge, how well you can change the heads on them, or what have you. We evaluate frequent use of the same product. In this example, I like to say that at my house we always have pizza on Friday nights, and I want the app with which I order my pizza to work flawlessly every time. So if I'm going to use something over and over again, I want it to be easy to use to start with, or if it's not that, it should be learnable within a very short period of time. Usability testing can help us figure that out. We can evaluate navigation schemes or information architectures. These are two different snapshots of Montana Techs 
navigational system on their website. The top one is right before we updated our branding on the bottom to the Montana Technological University. Uh, made it more compact and streamlined. Information belongs together. Okay. We increase awareness. You'll notice sometimes as you go to websites, they have the deal of the day, or if you drive past a store, they'll have the little folding sandwich board that said, hey, this is today's special. Okay. Well, here is one of the ones that Amazon showed to me at one time. We've got this uh, relaxation shoulder thingy that also turns into a hand purse. You can see that you know it used to be $220, and now it's just under $36. So if you're aware of it and interested, do you buy it? Okay, usability testing, we can run it through these um, heuristics. Okay. Problem discovery. Sometimes you just put something in front of users and ask them to use it, and then you watch them as they do and find out where they get stuck. And okay. you can identify issues, uh, generally open-ended, which means um, we don't have defined questions. And often our users will make their own path through the test. Right. So to move on from those hard and fast rules, we're looking to maximize usability for a critical product. Okay. Our products we want to be useful. Uh, the example here is a time card submittal application. And you want people to be successful when submitting their time cards, so don't put stumbling blocks in their way. And our overall goal, again, is happy users, happy users, happy users. How do we determine these, whether our users are happy or not? Well, we actually do the official test. Okay? A traditional usability test looks something like the picture here, where somebody sits down and tries to accomplish some tasks that you ask them to do. It can be executed in a lab or it can be in a classroom or at home or what have you. The general guidance is that you should have between five and ten participants to get the most value for your usability test. Okay. Well, the studies say that between five and ten participants can determine between 75 and 80 percent, I believe, of the issues in your product. Okay. Be careful with that because we don't know how many issues we programmed into our product, so we don't really know when we've got to 80% of them discovered. Okay. We'll have you use the think out loud process in a test where the task will be given and they will talk their way through it as they're doing it. Okay. This gives us some metrics. Um, you can use a small population of 5 to 10, or you can do 20, 100, 1,000 people uh, to get more and more data. You can do an unmoderated usability test where you pass it off to a company that does it for a living. Okay? You send your product in, they send it out to their anonymous to you testers, and then you get the data back and you can crunch it. These are some more of the unmoderated tools. You can video people, uh, you can ask for their report, you send them a product, they write back how they used it, or you can send it to experts and they will give a review of it, much like a movie critic, if you were. Okay. There's also the quantitative data on the right-hand side. We can count these things and get statistics about them. In our usability testing tools, this builds off of a talk we've already discussed this semester. Okay. We will be working with the usability lab studies in the upper left-hand corner, which are more qualitative and looking at behavior uh, as opposed to some of the others on the right-hand side, which are quantitative and you get hard numbers for. Uh, down at the bottom, you got focus groups, which are mostly attitude and qualitative. For our review, um, these are gaze plots and heat maps. The bigger dots show where people looked at or contacted the page with more often. So if you're going to be successful, you want to make sure you put your, mo your uh, most used information in those spots. Okay. So, in summary, Remember, we have two types of studies, two classes, formative, as you're forming your product, you're iteratively testing it, that's how you can remember it, and summative, when everything is all summed up at the end, we are done, then we test. Okay. Always take care to make sure we've got happy users. There are many different things that you can test, and there's several ways to run those tests. And at the end, we evaluate our data by crunching the numbers, looking for patterns, 
identifying pain points we might have missed, and then finding a way to fix them. Okay. So we've reached the end of this presentation, and we can stay tuned for more comments in just a minute. Please be kind and rewind. Well, as usual, I learned a lot. Hopefully you did too. Uh, we, all, we learned there were two types of study methodologies. We can do formative, that cyclical or iterative pattern as we're developing our product and testing, or we can do summative, and we can check for many things like can our users finish a transaction, can they repeatedly use a piece of equipment that they have to or like to, and many other things. So keep these in mind. And as we roll forward this semester into testing or, like I said, in your professional careers, hopefully you'll remember these things and they'll help you be successful. Uh, this is Professor B signing off for this episode. Stay tuned for others and more learning adventures.